Hey guys, welcome back to the podcast. This is part three of our airway class. You know, in a good world um, or in a perfect situation, your patient was sitting up at 90 degrees, you're pre oxygenating for three to five minutes, right? Everything has been addressed, uh, oxygenation, hemodynamics, right? You fluid resuscitated, all that good stuff. Yeah, you're at sea level. Right, now it's time to party, yeah. right? So you have your induction agent drawn up, you have your paralytic drawn up, you push your induction, flush it with your rock or with a yeah, flush. Yeah. Um, and then as your induction agent starts to hit, right? So we know our automate hits in 30 seconds, our ketamine's roughly 30 to 40 seconds as well. Um, but our rock is gonna be 60 seconds. When that 30 seconds, or when you start seeing your patients start being sedated, drop them down to 30 degrees, right? Put a blanket under their head to help them get into more ear to sternal knots positioning. Um, and then have somebody take the non breather off and innovate them at 30 degrees head elevation, right? So it's still gonna keep their weight off their diaphragm. You're gonna be able to ventilate that patient a lot easier right? Versus them laying flat. Cause remember what we said earlier was they lose approximately 30 to 50 milliliters of, or no, sorry, what was it again? 30 to 30, 50. Yeah. 30 to 50 milliliters of tidal volume when laying flat. Um, and then once you get them paid, once you get them innovated, secure, verify with the end title, right? It's a gold standard. And then two tamer and C collar in place just so for the patient neck movement. Uh, so here's some lateral x-rays of what the proper sniffing position is. I'm not going to go over all of those. Um, but if you look at the bottom right hand corner of that x-ray, the, they pattern read the patient's head while also doing a head tilt chin lift um, and it aligns the airway, right? It goes straight from your pharynx straight to the trachea or straight from the mouth opening to the trachea. It's just more in line. So, so right position, right? Yeah. Um, a lot of people are like, well, how do we accomplish this in the truck? Well, you might have to MacGyver it, right? Mm -hmm. If you have a patient who is obese like this, you might be padding from the very lower back all the way up to the top of the stretcher to get that ear to sternal notch positioning, right? It's gonna align that airway. Again, this is another detail. This might be, especially in pediatrics, that will definitely be, or positioning is, uh, might be whether you fail or you're successful, right? Yeah. Um, Lane shared a good video with me on this. Uh, I'm gonna go back to positioning and padding, but for pediatrics, you know, we often learn that you pattern the patient's shoulder blades and then that's your optimal view or your optimal uh, patient positioning. Well, um, innovating a few period pediatrics over the last few years, I've always noticed that the patient's head drops completely back and it's hyperextended. Mm -hmm. So I'll yeah. pattern the shoulders and I'll kind of pattern underneath the head as well. Actually might even pattern underneath the head a little bit more to kind of get them in a head elevated positioning and then head tilt chin lift when I go to drop the laryngoscope. So I think it's a very important, especially when you're going DL about lining up the airways. Um, placement with proof, right? So take your time. We like to tell people like you set yourself up for success, right? You pre oxygenated for at least three to five minutes, right? So you increased your safe apnea period. So it's going to give you a little extra time to, you know, handle a difficult airway. Sure. Um, you're suctioning, you've addressed hemodynamics, right? All you have to do is innovate. Um, you suction before and during the attempt. Uh, tube depth should be approximately three. Uh, three times the ET tube size. Um, that's not a set rule, right? Because yeah, everybody has a different anatomy. What we like to tell people is you, once you see the black line on the ET tube, go past the vocal cords, yep. you're done, yep. right? Um, and then confirm within title capnometry and waveform, gold standard. I know that this has been hit hard over the last five to 10 years. Um, and we tell our guys that it's not what you see, it's what you can prove and you yep. can prove your entitled capnography waveform and your digital reading. You can't, if you walk into an ER and it's an esophageal intubation and your excuse is, well, I saw it go through the vocal cords. Well, nobody cares yeah. or nobody gives a shit what you saw. Yeah. It's what you can prove. Absolutely. Um, I like to, uh, as part of my handoff report, like right before we take them off our monitor, mm -hmm. I like to call it out right before we take yep. them off. Like, hey guys, entitled right now is, you know, 38. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and if there's a, usually there's a nurse or a doctor close to the monitor yeah. and I'll actually, I'll point at it like, hey, yeah. Yeah. and then take it off and move it yeah. over because at that point it's on, it's on them, yep. you know, and, and I feel like you mitigate a little bit of uh, no, impossible you finger pointing. You did. You know, so. Because if all else fails and the tube was dislodged, um, all you have to do is like, well, y'all heard me call it the entire time. Like, yeah, we heard you call it out. Yeah. Like, I'm like, yeah, he said that. Like, okay, well then our tube was good, right? Yeah. And so just to piggyback off what you're saying, like we tell our medics, like, 
you transfer care, show them the monitor, call out your entire like you said, yeah. right? And then take everything off. Hit yeah. print. Yeah, hit print. <laughs> Um, and then secure it with a C collar and a tube tamer. Use a commercial tube tamer. No, I mean, people tape it, but use a little bit better device if you have it. Uh, so just going over a little bit of waveform capnography, um, we're not going to go over all the phases, but some of these are pretty important, like this esophageal in intubation, right? You might get a little end tidal, maybe four, maybe yeah. max five, but I promise you, it's going to dissipate. It's yeah. going to go to zero. There is no cellular respiration going on in the patient's stomach, right? Yeah. So if you don't have an entitled reading, you need to pull your tube, reevaluate. You know, maybe you need to put it in a high gel, whatever the case may be, depending on your disease process or what you're working with. Um, obviously, your normal ranges are 35 to 45. Um, we're real big into talking to our guys about rebreathing or breast stacking, especially with obstructive patients like maybe an asthmatic or a COPD and how to watch out for those things. Um, uh, curare cleft, I know Dr. Nortime is huge on this. If you see a curare cleft, which means inadequate sedation, mm -hmm. um, which should never happen because we tell our medics, you know, be liberal with pain and sedation. Do it earlier, and once you get to the hospital, I would do it again. Um, because it's going to take a while for that doctor to put in orders. Maybe that person's got to get a chest x-ray. Maybe they're going to go to CT. It might be 30, 45 minutes, maybe even an hour. And especially if they're on rocaronium, they might be freaking paralyzed and no sedations on board. So yeah. when we get to the hospital, we try to redose them, you know, immediately. Um, not really going to go over bronchospasms. We all know what shark fitting is. Yep. Um, significant head injury, right? We try to keep our entitle at 35. Um, you can go into that. I mean, it, basically doing that causes basic constriction that, you know, doesn't increase the amount of blood flow into the brain, which would obviously not be a good idea. Right. Just yeah. kind of keeping ICP down. We're not doing this whole, you know, like their entitle is 20 when we get to the hospital. Um, you know, severe vasoconstriction can actually yeah. worsen the, the situation. 35, yeah. 35 is the target. Yeah. Uh, hypercapnia is is what we're trying to avoid. Hypocapnia yeah. is kind of just... Yeah. Uh, and then DK, right, we hit this one pretty hard because if you are going to have a kill in the field... It's a DKA patient, right? Somebody who's in severe metabolic acidosis um, and you don't match their end title or, sure. and or rate, you know, uh, you could definitely kill that person. We'll go over that here in a little bit. So, although this is panicking when you say it, right? A little anxiety hits your voice whenever you say this. What happens if you miss? I don't miss. Right. <laughs> oh, better sure. not. Sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Um, but we like to tell our guys, like, so what if you do miss, right? Don't panic. Relax. You got the BVM out. You did have their oxygen that saturation is 100%. Just relax. Back them back up. You'll be fine. But the first thing that should hit your mind when you miss is that you need to change something, yep. right? Whether that's positioning. What did you see in the airway, right? Was it, do you need suctioning? Were you able to visualize? If you weren't, you probably need to position again. Um, uh, maybe it's the innovator, yeah. right? Um, it maybe would never be me. Maybe you're too. Maybe, <laughs> yeah. maybe you're too amped up. And, yeah, and maybe the handler just comes somebody else. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and I know this sounds kind of you know elementary. You know, something like your you know, your mom or dad would say, or maybe your school teacher. But insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expect, expecting the same results, right? Oh. So we tell our guys, if you miss, change something. And this has bit me bit me in the ass before. You yeah. know, when I first became a paramedic so I've been there as well you know, yeah like. oh actually I think the calls with you actually <laughs> yeah. so I, I might remember that yeah. one yeah so change something all right so your post innovation management uh obviously the two things you have to worry about at, at post innovation is worrying about or treating pain and sedation right and so our three drugs that we give uh is ketamine versed and fentanyl right not saying you need to give all three um, a lot of our medics make it easy and just give ketamine because it treats pain and sedation. Um, but, you know, you can also go Versed, but if you do go Versed, you have to give fentanyl because it only treats sedation, right? Yeah. Um, I find I found it a lot here lately that I'll be using all three, not at once, but like let's say if somebody gets, you know, pretty hypertensive off the ketamine, I'll go fentanyl, fentanyl Versed afterwards. Um, just the biggest thing that I've seen and I think we've gotten a lot better at over the years is being pretty liberal with it. Yeah. Like the last thing you want to do is risk anesthetic awareness while somebody's freaking paralyzed. If they have the room in their in their vital signs, you know, if they have the room yeah. in their blood pressure, yeah, yeah, make sure they're comfortable. Yeah, and that I might mean to. increasing your pressors or whatever else yeah. you got going on. That might mean adding a pressure if you need to. Yeah. Um, 
we have our infusions, uh, ketamine infusion and Versed infusions. Ketamine uh, infusion is one of the best tools we it have. Is, it it really is. It um, is. What I'll say is, like, uh, just to clarify any confusion out there, um, is you have to get that patient to a therapeutic threshold with push dose before you hang the drip, right? Yeah. yeah. So um, if your patient is trying to pull the tube out, starting them on a, on a one, yeah. to, one per kig infusion of ketamine is probably work. not it. Yeah. No. Nope. So yeah, get that loading dose of your IV push yeah. in there first and then work on mixing your bag. Yeah. Put it on the pump. Um, and then the scariest thing I've ever heard while teaching this stuff is like, oh, you know, the patient's moving around. Why not just redose them with a paralytic? And you're like, wait, what? Yeah. Um, last not ditch, saying last ditch effort. That's last ditch yeah. effort and it's after you've given a lot of sedation, right? And so I, what I like to tell people is, um, well, I like to tell people the story that I had was... Uh, you know, I had a post intubation or I was managing a patient. It was a transfer, and uh, we were sedating this patient with ketamine and Versed, and we could not get there. We, we couldn't put them down. Just they kept moving around and stuff like that. We were, I think, 400 milligrams deep of ketamine and 10 of Versed, 10 or 12 of Versed. Um, you know, it starts to become a patient safety issue. Sure. Right? Or crew safety issue where they're going to rip the tube out or something like that. Just redosing with the paralytic, just making sure that you manage your pain and sedation continuously. Yeah. So ventilator management, um, we get into a little bit on this, although all we have is a pair pack, you know, it's a very, uh, yeah. So, so, minimal. We, have, so we have the, we have the pair pack ventilators on all of our ambulances. Mm -hmm. uh, we use the Revell for, for our transfers. Um, uh, but yeah, we, it's a, it's a pneumatic driven yep. device. It's basically right. an automatic. What I tell people is it's an automatic BVM. Yeah. So it is. Um, so yeah, like you were saying, it's just very limited. You know, you can't really monitor a whole lot of your, uh, like your PIP and your, well, you can't monitor your PIP, but like your P plat or your VTE or something like that. Um, so what we kind of tell our guys is, uh, um, we go over two strategies. We really want to concentrate on the obstructive strategy, right? Um, so if you're listening out there, you know, you basically have two, two approaches to ventilator strategy, which is your injury approach and your obstructive approach. Your injury approach is just preventing injury, right? You just have a patient who's on the ventilator, maybe it's a traumatic or, you know, maybe it's just, you know, somebody without an obstructive disease process. Sure. Um, so what we tell our guys, if you have a patient with COPD and asthma, you want to lower their respiratory rate to keep them from breast stacking, right? So that might look like a tidal volume of 500, maybe a respiratory rate of 12, right? Yeah. Where, whereas injury approach would be like tidal volume of 350 and right. respiratory rate of like 20 or something. Yeah. yeah. So you're not giving that patient time to exhale, which they start breast stacking. Um, and also, you know, obviously that increases under thoracic pressure, which decreases cardiac output, right? That's where all the bad stuff occurs. Yeah. So by lowering that respiratory rate, extending that E time out, um, they have longer to exhale. So that's as far as we get into. And I think with the limited things that you can check on the pair pack, um, that these approaches can make some differences, but ultimately you're going to be looking at your entitle and yeah. kind of, you know, basing what changes need to be made off of that. Mm -hmm. so. And you're going to be watching your PIP. Your, your right. PIP, it has a, thankfully it has a blow off right. valve, so we can't truly yeah. like pop along with it. Yeah. Uh, so what is PIP? Yeah. So PIP, huh. peak yeah. inspiratory pressure. So I'm glad you said that um, <laughs> before we move on. Um, so... On the pair pack, right, it has a PIP alarm. You know, the gauge actually tells you what the patient's PIP is, but a lot of times people are like, they hear that alarm or they, there's a little dial in there where you can set the PIP, the PIP where you're actually setting the alarm, yeah. right? So if you hear the alarm, don't ignore it, right? It's don't fine. up your alarm to 100. <laughs> it's trying to tell you something, right? And so we use, I think like everybody else, is the dope mnemonic. Um, well, I guess let me go back and explain PIP real quick. So peak inspiratory pressure, basically, and don't shoot me for this, but it is the maximum amount of pressure that it takes to deliver that volume of gas or that 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 volume of breath, okay. right? Yeah. So what will make things, well, what will make a PIP high, right? So anything that will increase that pressure. So let's say if somebody's inadequately sedated and they're breathing against the vent, well now that volume of gas has a harder time being delivered, so that'll increase, right? So make sure that your patient's sedated. Uh, maybe the patient developed a pneumothorax, right? So now that lung is collapsed. Now that now that that ventilator has a higher pressure to go against to deliver that volume of gas. So maybe you developed a pneumo. Maybe you need to dart that patient. Now, I guarantee you, you probably have to dart them continuously right to the hospital if they do develop a pneumo, right? Because yeah. now they're under positive pressure ventilation. 
Um, could be suctioning or, or, yeah, or somebody could. just like lifted the armrail up and it pinched the tubing in there. Yeah. I mean, it yeah. could be the tube yeah. is kinked somewhere. I mean, or the, yeah. the ET tube has flopped over and is now, <laughs> yeah. is now kinked off. Or yeah. So if you did see a lower or a high pressure or a pipal arm, just start from the patient and start checking every single thing all the way up to the ventilator. And yeah. It's a good way to not miss yeah. something. And all, if all else fails, take them off the ventilator, put them on the VDM. Yes. Um, what about low PIP? And so if you have a low PIP, right, let's say just good question, for right? an example, Thank you. your PIP was, let's say, 18. And then in route, you notice it's five, you know, maybe it's 10. Five, yeah. And you're like, oh, that's not right. <laughs> yeah. And so what would cause a low PIP? Well, an air leak, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe your cuff, I would check the cuff. Maybe your tube has become dislodged or maybe it's at the opening of the, or maybe it's at the glottic opening. Maybe it just migrated a little bit. Um, so anything basically what's, uh, that's going to lessen the pressure that that volume of, ha volume of gas has to get through or that volume of breath. So... Um, moving on, so reassessment, right? Obviously, you've got to continually monitor patients' uh, uh, ET2 placement, sedation, pain, and vital signs. Um, uh, we already went over the dope mnemonic for uh, high PIP readings or, or low PIP readings. Um, and then oxygenation, oxygenation and tidal CO2 adjustments, right? So oxygenation, you're going to, only two things, like we said earlier, that affect oxygenation is PEEP and FiO2. So I made the mistake on the pair pack of doing air mix, which is 50% FiO2. Um, and the patient's oxygen saturation got down to like 88, 90%. I'm like, what is going on here? They were at yeah. 100 a while ago, right? Yeah. So I'm trying to, you know, go through everything, like listen to lung sounds, make sure I'm not right. Main stem, I look at my end title, like, okay, the tube's good. Um, it's connected to oxygen. I'm like, oh, it's at 50% FiO2 yeah. on a patient I just innovated. So check that. Yeah, um, so we leave them at 100% until yeah. they leave the hospital. Yeah, always, I mean. right? Yeah, yeah. And then end title, CO2, uh, you adjust that with your respiratory rate, basically. I wouldn't really adjust your tidal volume, which you could, but respiratory rate would be my initial And on the bed, I'd say, you know, make small changes, you know, and then reassess. So the very last part of our, our slideshow or our presentation goes over special considerations. And we just talked to our paramedics about, you know, like your different approaches for this. Like, so let's say if you have a COPD patient, right? So uh, I think one of the problems we get into a COPD patients is waiting to start non-invasive press positive pressure ventilation, right? Um, I like to tell people that if I walk into a room and I see somebody tripoding and they're pale, diaphoretic, they're uh, nowhere dipsnia, right? They're obviously like maybe purse lip breathing, right? They're trying to retain that peep. I could care less about what the oxygen saturations and tidal are right this second. Mm -hmm. Not saying they're very valuable. Obviously, you want yeah. those things. But my first, the first thing I'm going to do is grab CPAP BiPAP and I'm slapping on the patient immediately. Coach them through it while somebody else is getting my vital signs because I can always switch gears and take it off yeah. if something else is changing. But you know, just being proactive, you know, it goes back to your decision making. Being proactive and setting yourself up for, up for success um, is going to help you out in the long run. Uh, you know, with the COPD patient, it might take you longer to pre oxygenate. Um, I'd probably go ketamine for my induction, definitely for post innovation sedation for bronchodilation. Um, maybe you're going to use the obstructive approach on the ventilator, right, so they don't breast stack on you on the way to the hospital. This could be a DSI situation because. What happens when somebody gets real anxious and they're hypoxic? Hypoxic, their 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 anxiety is through the roof, and they're trying to rip the mask off. Right? Sure. Um, CHF patients, um, you know, you might need peep. I know you have a, t a couple terrible stories where you had somebody who had uh, flash pulmonary edema yeah. and bloody frothy sputum was coming out the tube, and suction wasn't happening or yeah. wasn't taking care of it. Yeah, right? For some reason, it just kept coming out. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, yeah. So that might be a situation where you add. Um, more PEEP, right? You might get up to 20 of PEEP trying to increase yep. that um, that surface area to push the blood back out. Um, yeah, every time you disconnect to suction, you lose all the recruitment you had. Yeah. So uh, PEEP is better than suction in those situations, yeah. 100%. Um, with your TBI, um, you know, you have to, you have to know that uh, you have to keep their end title at 35, right? Along with head elevation and... Uh, um, loosen in the C collar because that increases ICP. So things you have to worry about. Um, stroke patients, you might have to switch gears and manage blood pressure a little bit, right? You might have to give some little beta law. Uh, maybe go atomidate if their pressure is pretty high. Uh, maybe go fentanyl verset afterwards. Yep, fentanyl verset is, is <coughs> a favorite for for you know stroke patients. You've had okay. the I mean, it doesn't drop their pressure, but it definitely brings it down a little bit. And it, Takes the edge off for sure. So. On the pregnancy and obesity patients, you know, we talked about earlier about 
decrease time to desaturation, you might do everything right. They're still going to have a shorter window mm -hmm. than anybody else. Yep. So it's just, you got to think about that. And that doesn't mean rush through it, but do everything that we talked about leading up yeah. and trying to be successful. I think one thing that's really important for, for probably, you know, guys like us that have big egos, uh, is not letting your ego necessarily get in the way, you know. Like let's oh, say yeah. let's say you have this, you know, pregnancy patient or pregnant patient or obese patient, and you're you're trying to innovate, and you're like, I never miss. Yeah. And you can't get it for whatever yeah, reason. No. If they don't have a contraindication for an eye gel, mm -hmm. put an eye gel in. Yep. Like 100%. like let it go. Put an eye gel in because That's, like you like Lane was just saying, yeah. like you don't have a big one. Yeah. So. And you know, in scary situations like that, you know, it's been said over and over and over again. Like you get tunnel vision. Mm -hmm. You get tunnel vision. And time is just, you're not keeping track of time like you should be. Yeah. Um, and so it's always good to have a team approach like, hey, your oxygen saturation is 92%. Okay, I'm going to fill the airway now. Yeah. Back out, start bagging. And like you said, progress to an eye gel if you need to. Yeah. Um, um, so moving on to DKA. So we're going to all lead with this. You should try not to ever innovate somebody with DKA, right? Um, because can, these I are the wonder. ones that yeah. you, you can kill. Um, uh, we have a crew here who did it. Um, who killed it, him? No, 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 no. Who innovated a DKA patient? They did a really good job. Yeah, um, I heard about that one. So, as far as setting up your DKA patient, so let's just go into the pathophys of DKA so, just a little shout bit. Shout out to uh, Zach and Denise. Yeah, shout so, out to yeah. Zach and Denise. Um, and that really irks me to say that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but obviously, um, we're not going to go too far into the patho, but they're you know metabolic acid. They're in metabolic acidosis, right? So they're breathing off CO2, CO2 to uh, keep their pH in a normal range or in a somewhat normal range. That's how they're compensating. Sure. So long story short, if you innovate that person and uh, they were breathing at, let's say, 30 to 40 times a minute and you put them on the vent at a respiratory rate of 16, which is going to increase their end tidal, which is the way they were compensating, right? Their end tidal is going to go through the roof, which is going to shift their pH in the opposite direction and they're going to die. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So, so do you want to match their respiratory rate or their end tidal? I would try to match their end tidal before they were sedated. Before, and I would also count their respirations because, and Lane does a very good job of explaining this, is when you take somebody take somebody's ventilations over um, or you paralyze them, right, what they were breathing at is not the same quality as what we're giving them with the ventilator, right? They could have been taking shallow breaths. Yeah. So they're 40 a minute, and if we put them 40 on the vent, or we're bagging them at 40 times a minute, yeah. it's not going to be the same. Yeah. So their time volume is not going to be the same. Ultimately, yeah. watching the end title. I'm right. not. I don't really want to put somebody on 40, 50 breaths a minute on the vent. Like I, that's. Yeah. I typically tell people 30 is really the the safe yeah. max on our vents. Yeah. I would just say, try to match their end title the best you can. You know. Um, so yeah, that's what DKA. He went over obesity, right? Burns. Uh, you know, I would be a lot more proactive with these than I am with most. Um, so just the situation that I was in, um, patient was, uh, had like a flash burn from like a bonfire. Um, really nothing inside the, the mouth, but he had like singed nose hair. What really made my decision is he had second, third degree burns to his neck, which was swelling up. So although he didn't have any airway burns um, that I could see, we went ahead and took his airway um, just because you have to be a good clinician and be a uh, you know be able to predict you know the downfall or the uh, what do you call it um, projected clinical course yeah, yeah. you had that swelling neck though I mean, yeah like that's, yeah that's yeah. concerning yeah. Um, so <laughs> documentation right it's really big um, in any patient but specifically with RSI right because we are um, uh, I guess under a microscope. As yeah. you would say, well, I mean, you're, as far you're... as RSI is concerned, especially in the pre-hospital setting, and we're just paramedics. You know, we have to document, you know, how we did. The, the patient has a significant amount of risk. I mean, right. So. Um, so we do the the why. So why was it performed? Don't just write your narrative and assume that we are going to know, or whoever's QA in the chart, or whoever's looking at the chart is going to assume why the patient was innovated. You have to specifically put. So I think it's pretty safe to say that most, if not all, your patients you put you know, a uh, patient was innovated due to uh, poor clinical course or ventilatory failure, um, uh, then move on to the, you know, who performed the procedure. We like to tell our people that, state this specifically, like, you know, paramedic Lane Matheny made the decision to perform RSI secondary to blah, 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 right? And then how was it performed, right? Going to 
you know, as far as like, I, w I want be, to be very detailed. My patient was set up or seated at 90 degrees, pre oxygenated with such such devices for however long. Um, you push whichever medications. Did you have any um, complications during your attempt? If no, state that specifically, right? No complications were noted during the innovation attempt or patient was suctioned due to blah, 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 blah. And on, um, another thing on the how is if you did do the DSI or RSA, explain that mm -hmm. because if you just try to look at your flow chart or how the meds were given, you know, we, we don't, don't know, know that. We want you yeah. to say it so we know that your you know your mindset on the call why it was you know different than a normal RSI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and then obviously you know you need to put how you document how you reconfirmed right. And we try to get the ER physician to sign an airway confirmation. You know now some of them kind of wait till want to wait till the X-ray, even though we show them in title. Yeah. Even though they're listening to lung is, sounds, they're like, right. okay, I've got good lung sounds, yeah. no epigastric. Right. Uh, let me get an x-ray. Okay. Yeah, I love it whenever they listen to lung sounds, like, oh, yeah, it's fine. But, you know, they're not messing with the airway, but they won't sign the chart. You know what I mean? They're like, i got to get yeah. well, absolute. I've had, I've had pretty good experience over the last couple of years, honestly, with that, yeah. though. Like, I feel like maybe they're getting used to us getting that signature. Yeah. I don't know. But yeah. I, I definitely had a lot of grief. I got a lot of grief for that one. Definitely, yeah. like, three or four years ago. Yeah. People didn't want to sign that. So. Yeah. But a lot of this stuff is just to cover yourself, you know, for the patient's medical record. So everything we know, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if there's a complication, like we need to be able to, you know, prove, hey, you know, it wasn't on us or, hey, yeah. you know, we, we had a good reason to take this person's airway. Yeah. Um, so that was the end of our presentation. Um, so that's just the way we do things here at PCHDMS. Um, and I think just if you were kind of condense it all down into one, it's, you know, it's education and more importantly, it's, it's practice. Yeah. Like you have to practice. I think that's why we are so good in our success rates are 94, 95% on our first attempt, which is unheard of for EMS um, or, or rare as I'd yeah. like to say. Um, and it goes down to how you practice. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think you can have a lot of different, you know, complications, you know, uh, somebody's vomiting or you know, obese, but it's how you handle everything up to that. If you've practiced scenarios, you've done training, you're mm -hmm. familiar with your equipment, you can kind of combat all those issues and, yeah. you know, not yeah. be caught with your pants down. Yeah, and what we love to say, I'm glad you said that, uh, is you're, I promise you, you're not going to, you're not going to pull these skills out of your ass yeah. on the fly during a difficult situation. Yeah. I promise you, you're not. You it know, doesn't. It doesn't happen like that. You're not, you're not all all of a sudden become a superhero whenever shit hits the fan. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, I think it's interesting. You know, this whole airway class. Uh, I think it's it's interesting because so little of it is actually focused on putting the laryngoscope in the mouth. Yeah. And intubating. Them. Well, I mean, almost almost none of it is. Yeah. It's, it's all about the. It's all about the entire. Yeah. Picture and making sure you cover your. Yeah. Bases. So when we were making this presentation, Lane was real big into, uh, you know, I want people to have the mindset, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, the mindset and understanding of what it takes to become successful, right? It's not, you can read something a thousand times, but until you actually do it, are you, you know, are you really good at it? No, yeah. like you got to practice, right? The, the RSIs that I've been on that have, that I've felt the most, that I felt were the most successful, mm -hmm. were the, the best performed, whatever you want to call it, were the ones where we literally like, I mean, yeah, we knew we were going to RSI, but it was it was kind of on the back burner, and we were all just you know doing IVs, mm -hmm. pressors, fluid, you know, just yeah. everything else. And then once we got there, we got there. Yeah. But I, I think you know when you're when all you can think about is putting that tube in, then yeah, you're going to miss some stuff. Yeah, yeah, no. So I hope y'all enjoyed it. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed yeah. talking to you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for uh, for going over this with us. I know you guys yeah. have done it probably like what twenty times at yeah. this point. Yeah. Uh, this week. yeah. So I mean, really, you should be you should be better at it. You know? <laughs> uh, yeah. No, but thank you guys. Yeah, we're new to this, so you know, forgive us for uh, not Holy knowing. Yeah, exactly, and, exactly. Yeah. So I'm trying to hide my hands because they were shaking a little Dude, bit. You, you know? know, you just sometimes don't know what to do with your yeah. hands. So it just goes back to performance it. anxiety, man. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Just box <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you guys for listening and or watching, and uh, you guys be safe out there. This has been an episode of the PCHD EMS podcast. 
Thank you for joining us.